every few years, my friend Liz holds what she calls a potlatch. She brings all the things that she no longer wants, that she has accumulated over the previous years, to the common house in our neighborhood. She spreads them all out, sometimes the collection of things is considerable, and tells people to take what they would like. This isn't a garage sale. She expects nothing in return. It is her way of giving back, of providing gifts to the community. What people do not take away with them, she gives away to local charities. She does not expect that anyone else will hold a potlatch so that her gift might in any way be reciprocated. My sister puts unwanted household items out to the curb in her affluent suburb a few days before garbage day. She knows that junk men will come by in their trucks and pick these items up for use or sale in the surrounding poorer communities. She also does not expect anything in return. The idea of gift economies that are not based on market value goes way back. My friend bases her potlatch idea on the practice of the Northwest indigenous people of North America. According to Lewis Hyde in his book, The Gift, potlatches were almost always given by one tribe for another. Status and generosity were always associated. No man could become a man of position without giving away property. The community would prepare for a year, creating and preparing all the gifts to be given away. In other words, generosity was the very nature of status. It was not what a person had accumulated, but rather the person's ability to give goods away. Western interpretations of so-called Indian giving were simply a misunderstanding of the idea of a gift economy. When a gift was fully given, it was expected that the receiver would in turn not return the gift to the giver, but to pay forward the gift or something comparable to someone else. If the gift were hoarded by the receiver, then it would lose its value. The value then was its value as gift, something to be passed on, not in the ability of the gift itself to be acquired or hoarded. When the natives noticed that the settlers had kept gifts given to them, they asked for them back. For them, the gift needed to keep going. Gift was something fluid and dynamic. It was circular, not linear, as gifts continuously circulated within and among indigenous peoples. Any market value was a superfluous notion. The idea of gift has not disappeared, as exemplified by my friend Liz and my sister. But modern people are often caught up in the mind-forged manacles of the reigning culture in which commodity exchanges pass for gifts. The dynamics of gift exchange are explained by theologian Anne Primavesi. In the actual process of giving, the dynamic disequilibrium between giver and receiver, for the giver would necessarily have something not possessed by the receiver, facilitates and drives the process in which the receiver becomes the giver. And so the giving proceeds and evolves. It does not stop at what was given or received, but endures in the relationship between giver, gift, and receiver, even when one or all of them disappear from view. As to the freedom associated with all those involved endures in the process. Prima Vesi sets up this idea of gift 
in order to show how the earth itself and its processes act as gift economies. The earth has bestowed on all living things the gift of everything that is needed, not just for their survival, but in order for them to thrive. This is the earth's ongoing gift that started at the beginning of time and continues into the present. It is our responsibility as receivers of these gifts to pay these gifts forward. We who are given so much of earth's abundance for our thriving should in turn be trying to figure out how to use this abundance for the flourishing of all. The earth begins the gift process. It is our responsibility to pay forward the gift and keep it moving both to those around us and to those who might thrive in the future. Oscar Wilde once wrote, nowadays people know the price of everything and the value of nothing. This is as true now as it was when Oscar Wilde first wrote it over a century ago. In fact, writes ethicist Michael Sandel, we have gone from having a market economy to becoming a market society. In other words, we now commodify almost everything by putting a price on it without actually understanding its value. This is particularly true in our relationship to the earth. Under our current economic system, the earth and its more than human inhabitants are seen as something separate from humanity, to be exploited and used not for the flourishing of all, but rather for the enrichment of a few. Even though the earth has been around for millennia before humanity, and will probably be around far beyond our existence, some humans believe that we can own it and its gifts. We do not see that we belong to the earth and not the other way around. I do not mean that the earth owns us. I mean that we belong to the earth in the same way that trees or birds or inchworms belong to the earth. We are, as our Unitarian Universalist principles tell us, part of the interconnected web of all existence. There is no we separate from the very systems that sustain us. And that the economic system of which we are a part is based on the premise that each human is an individual I, separate from all other individual eyes. Each of these individuals is not working toward the flourishing of the whole, but rather for the monetary enrichment of only themselves, divorced from and not beholden to common concrete ends of their community or the community of the earth and all its beings. David Corton writes in his essay, The Post-Corporate World, our obsession with money has led us to create an economic system that values life only for its contribution to making money. When the very gifts of the earth that are necessary for survival, like water, are extracted by large corporate entities who pay almost nothing to do so and then sell it for exorbitant prices, the gifts of the earth are not only being abused, they are being exploited to the detriment of others. When huge amounts of water are deliberately contaminated for profit and humans and others are harmed but have no legal recourse, then we are not paying forward the gifts of the earth. Yet Corton continues on a slightly more optimistic note. With the survival of civilization, and perhaps even our species now at risk, we have begun to awaken to the fact that our living planet is the source of all real wealth and the foundation of our existence. It is in understanding our role in relationship to other humans and the more than human world that we might find a way to survive. Corton goes on to write, the species that survive and prosper are those that find a niche in which they meet their own needs in ways that simultaneously serve others. As we go forth today, let us think about the ways in which we can both feel gratitude for the gifts that we have been given freely by the earth. 
Let us think about how we might steward those gifts so that they might be available for both ourselves and others, both now and in the future. Let us think of the ways we can separate value from commodification. And finally, let us ponder the value of the Earth's gifts for their survival and thriving for all life. May it be so.